Hello everyone, this is Alicia Walton, and I am going to be reviewing Week 3's lecture. So for this week, we're going to go over the following Lannan and Gurek readings, which I have distilled down into the following discussion topics. First, how do you analyze an audience's technical background? Then, I want to talk to you about identifying your specific persuasive goals when you're writing within a technical document. And then finally, we're going to talk about common workplace letters. And again, each of these um, are built upon your readings from the Land and Gurick selection here that I have listed above. So, first, let's go into how to analyze. An audience's technical background. Analyzing an audience's technical background sounds a lot more frightening than it is. It's really very basic. In a way, you do it every time you talk to somebody in your family and you're updating them about current events that are going on in your life. You analyze an audience's technical background every time you meet a new person when you're at work and you have to find out how familiar they are with topics X, Y, and Z before you can help them to understand something at work or even possibly when training them if you're responsible for such tasks. So let's go on here a bit, and I'll explain this a bit further. So let's talk about how you can identify your audience's technical background. You're going to be, usually your, your audience is going to be making their technical background available for you. So this isn't something you're going to have to search for very hard. For example, if again, you're at work and you're maybe you're not in charge of training the new person sitting next to you, but perhaps they have questions for you and you're helping kind of supplement some of what they learn, they've learned in training or you're just being friendly. And you want to help them, you know, get a get adjusted to work life. You're going to have to ask them a little bit about their background and they're going to tell you, you know, hi, I, you know, I have a background in IT and I know a lot about programming, but I don't understand how to use this software that they have us using. So can you show me how to create a PO, right? And then Maybe they might ask you what a PO is. And a PO could be all kinds of things. And in some places, it's a purchase order, right? That's what I mean when I say PO. But it's good to know what somebody's talking about whenever they use an abbreviation. And it's good to know an audience's technical background. So how do you analyze an audience's technical background? If you can, ask. Right? Most of the time, you can ask. Now, if you're writing a document or a letter, for instance, you might not be able to openly ask, but you can make a few judgment calls. So, in our class, you know that you're going to be writing things for me. And you know that I'm your English instructor. You know that I'm studying to get my PhD in rhetoric, which is just a philosophy focus and even more English. So chances are I might not have the same engineering background that you have, right? Uh, so you can make some guesses or some kind of educated guesses as to your audience, but Get to know your audience. That's what I'm headed towards there.
So get to know who your audience is. So I've told you several things about me now. Now, even though I don't have an engineering background, I've worked with a lot of engineers in creating technical documents. So I'm familiar with more terms and more tools than you might imagine. Even so, I'm still an English instructor. <laughs> there are things, a lot of things I don't know. So if you're a programmer, there's going to be many things that you're going to have to explain to me. If you're writing me, uh, if you're giving me an update about a program that you're writing. So how do you analyze an audience's technical background? You ask them. Get to know your audience. Uh, you can also just kind of brainstorm and build an evaluation of your audience. Now, what do I mean by that? Building an evaluation of your audience, by that I mean just think about the people who are going to be receiving the document that you're creating. For instance, if you're at work and your job is to write an update to send to your manager and their colleagues, then you have to think about what they want to know, what they need to know, what they don't need to know, and what kind of information you need to be providing for them so that they can get the message. So, when creating your message, once you've analyzed your audience, or when you're analyzing your audience's technical background, What does your audience need to know? Now this will depend on who they are, just as much as it will depend on their technical background, right? So what does your audience need to know? What do you need to tell them? Or what is your message? What should you leave out? So if you know that your audience doesn't have, uh, for instance, you're giving an audience an update um, and they're your boss and you know that your boss is familiar with high level concepts of what your team is doing. Uh, however, your boss doesn't know a lot about the details of it. He may not want to know, or she may not want to know the details of it. She might simply just want to know, at a very high level, the status of the project that you're working on. Figure out what you need to tell them. What is your message? What does your audience need to know? And think about what you should be leaving out. There are uh, many times in your career in which you're going to accidentally tell somebody information that you're going to wish you hadn't. And its I don't mean that in a negative way. I simply mean that giving an audience too much information can be confusing. Okay, so let's go ahead and get back to some of our other topics. Let's move on here. Let's talk about identifying your specific persuasive goal when writing a message. Now, what do I mean by identifying your specific persuasive goal? 
what I mean by that is whenever you write a message you have a specific persuasive goal whether you realize it or not typically you have a message that you're trying to bring across as I mentioned before when you're creating a message you need to know what technical background or what technical expertise your audience has you need to know what your audience you need to or not need to know but you need to consider what your audience needs to know you need to discover what you should be telling them or what your message should be and you need to think about what you should be leaving out if you don't know these things then you should not be sending out a message and when you're doing this when you think about your message within the message itself you're going to have a specific persuasive goal now if you're looking back at your books you can turn to page 35 and follow along with me here uh, typically you're going to be and the authors lay this out rather nicely uh, they identify several persuasive goals that you could be working to achieve the first one is you could be arguing to influence someone's opinion so your goal could be that you want to change someone's mind about something right uh, there's a lot of examples for that one. It could just simply be that you are working to extend a deadline for a project that your team's been working on, or that you're trying to convince someone that you work with that your way for creating X, Y, and Z that that your goal is to create that that that's the way to do it and the way that they're doing it is wrong and this is going to save the company time etc so that the list goes on you could also be arguing to enlist people's support so within for instance the message that I mentioned before where you're updating your boss and his colleagues about the status of a project that you and your team are working on you could be it could be said that in reporting your status you could also be trying to enlist their support for your project whenever you work within a company there's a lot of politics that go on and there's a continual back and forth in trying to get support from one person or another or one department or another and that could be playing into things as well and if you're submitting a proposal you could be asking them to endorse a proposal and by this I mean if you're trying to uh, if your goal is to get more money for something or to change something within your work structure or maybe you're trying to talk your supervisor into giving you more duties because you know that you can prove to your boss that you're deserving of uh, the next big title out you know above you then perhaps you're trying to get them to support you and endorsing you there but you could also be literally trying to get them to endorse a proposal that you have uh, for like I was saying for change within the company 
Another one could be that you're arguing to change people's behavior. That one's a bit more tricky. But again, um, you could be trying to get a, a coworker to do something differently and work with you in a different way. All of these are ways that you can be trying to be persuasive. Within every message that you send, there is something persuasive that you're trying to achieve. And there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of times, it's uh, being persuasive is looked upon as, as a, a negative thing. There's nothing negative about it unless you're trying to do something negative with it. So that's kind of the gauge there. It's all in what you're trying to do. So be aware of, of what you're trying to be persuasive with and, and how you're doing it. Um, also, after you watch this lecture, I advise that you watch the following lecture on uh, the definition of rhetoric and rhetorical analysis. And that will give you more information about how to be persuasive and how to build out the message to be, to, messages to be persuasive. Your book goes more into how to predict audience reaction and how to expect audience resistance. I think those are great things to consider. I think these are things that most of you are already quite familiar with and you've been familiar with since you've been able to talk and work with your parents and try to get whatever it is that you wanted to get when you were a teenager that they wouldn't give to you or that they did give to you <laughs> if you were successful. So I'm not going to bore you with all the terrible details, but do think about things like audience reaction and audience resistance. We will talk more throughout the semester about how to use ethos, pathos, and logos, the rhetorical devices, and how to use these in, in, in working with audience resistance, and how to use these also in working with audience reaction as well. So let's move on and talk about common workplace letters. Most of the time when I ask students to think about common workplace letters that are used within their offices or within their workplace that could be considered technical writing documents, I hear a lot of silence. And that's why I like to go ahead and briefly cover this within the lecture. So there are a lot of letters that fall under this category of common workplace letters that are also technical communication or technical writing documents. And you will also see me use TechCom as an abbreviation there too. So let's just very quickly go through a listing here. Sales letters. These are, these are considered a type of technical communication document. Again, these are also considered uh, a type of business communication document as well. This is where the two genres overlap, as I mentioned in week one. Inquiry letters. Inquiry letters depend on the field you're in, obviously, whether or not some of these are going to come into play. But inquiry letters uh, are something that were used a lot more in the past that aren't used so much now. Uh, these can be used for sales, uh, just as a um, kind of a precursor to the sales letter, more of an introduction. It can also be used to ask questions and request a reply. and um, 
Sometimes they're solicited, sometimes they're unsolicited. And they can also be used when preparing feasibility reports as well. So these work hand in hand with other reports and other letters. There can also be a request for interview letters, which I giggle at this because most of the time you receive an email. Any of these you may see as emails now. However, the rules for them don't really change. You may see them in your textbook and letter format but they will be laid out within emails in the same way. They're just electronic and that's the only thing that changes. It, there might be uh, some other little things that change as well. They, so if something can't be stamped, for instance, that would change, but otherwise. Um, some of these are obviously outdated, but then if you work in the medical field or in the legal field, many of these are still used. Memos are often still used. It's kind of strange. Uh, a lot of technical communication books don't even mention memos anymore because it's considered an outdated type of communication. But if you've watched Fox News or CNN lately and heard any discussion of memos, they are still used uh, within politics, within the White House, between governments, in the legal field, in the medical field, uh, they're still used at some universities. You'll also see uh, some companies use uh, create claim letters. Those are often used in insurance companies. Uh, they can be used if, uh, if there's some kind of injury or mistake. Or something to that effect. And then there's also adjustment letters. So at some point I stopped capitalizing. But I have to go back and fix it. Alright, so here's just a few examples. Your workplace may not even use any of these. Or you might be one of the lucky lucky beasts in my audience here who get to work for a place that uses all of these and even more. <laughs> but these are some examples of workplace letters and they are listed within our book and one of the reasons I talk about this and I at least go over it and it, it let you look at some of the examples which include copies of the actual letters is so that you can see them. There's nothing worse than going into a field and, and not being familiar at all whatsoever with something of this nature. All right, so we've talked about analyzing an audience's technical background. We've reviewed how to identify your specific persuasive goal within a message or how you should at least be thinking about it. And then we've also identified some common workplace letters. As always, if you have any questions about any of this, please send me an email. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.